If you record audio for any purpose, chances are you want it to be heard. You want to attract the largest audience possible who can hear your message. That's where we come in. We're CyberEars.com, a revolutionary Internet service that will host your audio files and help you promote and track its popularity. Considering hosting a podcast to the world? We have all the automated tools to make the process as simple and easy as it can be. No technical mumbo-jumbo to work out. CyberEars.com does all the work for you. You record it, we take care of the rest. So don't delay. Go to CyberEars.com today and register for a free trial account. Upload your audio files and get heard. With CyberEars.com, it's your audio on your terms. Ah, Jeff Fritzman, another fine day, another fine peritopia headed our way. Eh? That's right. That's right. It's on its way. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? I'm uh, feeling it. I'm feeling it. Um, if anyone hears He-Man in the background, that's because uh, He-Man is on in the background. As I said, I'm staying at someone else's place for a month. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You may wonder, why would grown people watch He-Man? Do they have children in the room? Well, maybe not. I'm just saying they like to watch He-Man. That's all I'm saying. It, I'm not making judgments. Isn't that Skeletor and all that? And yes. That yeah. Jesus. Product placement. Yes. So, before we begin, I guess uh, we should address the Phil Imbrogni issue. I guess yeah. that, that's the plural of Imbrogno, right? I, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, now, I had said, I think on the last show, somewhere I said, uh, maybe give him, give him some time. And then I think I said two months, either on the show or on the message board. I don't remember where. But uh, that's turned into a week. I think, <laughs> I think we've given him plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have asked him for the name of a professor. I have heard nothing. Um, somebody showed up on the ATS message board, um, Bad Boy 666 which while that sounds like it should not be him... Um, all indications are that it very well could be him. Yeah. Um, and what that person is saying smacks of what he told me privately, but is not exactly the same. And certainly the reason for his silence is not at all what is written there. Um, but I, would I be, would I be right in saying that, uh, this post on ATS more or less admits that, uh, yeah, yeah. That, the, that the post on ATS is, <laughs> You know, it's like the, the the oil can Harry bad guy confession, you know? Right, right. And I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling kids or something, mm-hmm. you know? It's yeah. pretty silly uh, stuff, actually. But I just wanted to say that I had emailed him asking him if that was him, and I haven't heard anything back. So uh, sure. I'm going to take the advice of some uh, of an actual doctor and academic, Dr. Tyler Cokejohn, who says that this man needs to give you something. If he doesn't give you something, then... That's it. Uh, right. Because he can. Um, and he hasn't. So that's it. Uh, yeah. End of story. Yeah. So I guess we should say that that thread at ATS, uh, you know, I, I kind of got into it a little bit with uh, Lance uh, Moody over there. Lance being the guy who I think originally, or one of the original people to come out with this uh, story that they looked into his educational background. And, um, uh, I don't know. I think uh, we got off on a bad foot somewhere for probably the second time. I think, <laughs> I think it was. But uh, you know, essentially, where we were being accused of being Phil's mouthpiece, so that we were defending him, and that wasn't the case at all. The, the problem that I had was that Lance earlier in the thread had said, you know, nobody asked him for the information. Nobody came to him for it. And so when I heard that, I kind of took that as an open invitation, and I said, well, I would like to see what you have. Here's my email. Would you send it to me? I would like to look at it. And um, and it was at that point where he said, no, I won't. 
uh, I've sent it to enough people and that's the end of it. And, um, uh, and then it became uh, pretty much a day long, um, uh, that makes me suspicious. I mean, when you say you've got data and then all of a sudden you're not willing to share it with people who ask for it once you more or less offer it. And so I found that suspicious. I mean, that's just my nature that, uh, I mean, we have that in UFO cases as well. Somebody says, I've got this amazing evidence. And yet when you call them and say, I'd like to see that, you never get it. Um, this happens all the time. So the way I put it was that shit works both ways. And it turned out um, that Lance essentially, like I said, uh, assumed somehow that we were in cahoots with him and uh, and were defending him. And he did not want to turn over any data to somebody who he thought was going to take it back to Phil to use as some kind of ammunition or stall tactic or whatever. And so I can understand that. I, I wish we'd have uh, come to that understanding early on in the conversation I, so I could have set him straight. But um, – we ended up uh, speaking in emails privately where I did set him straight on that. And then uh, we talked today on the phone. And, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, he seems like a, a decent guy. And, um, and we're looking into some other things here. Um, I don't know how much effort we really want to put into it. I think at this point it's kind of a mood issue. It seems to be exactly as Lance has, has said. It's uh, – uh, the, the credentials are, are not adding up and end of story. So, uh, well, and to Lance's defense on that, I just, I'm just thinking this now, as you're saying all of this, okay. I don't know why yeah. I didn't think of this before, but, um, because here's the thing about Lance Moody. Now this guy goes on message boards, um, and listens to these shows and he always has, he's a debunker, right? So he has always had something negative to say about the paranormal. So it's like, why, why is a guy like that even listening to this stuff? I mean, is it just to toot his own horn and say, look how smart I am, everyone on a message board, to the point where he gets kicked off those boards? So it's kind of hard to not fall in love with Lance at first glance. Um, however, <laughs> in his defense, uh, I will say that he was sharing information with another show, and mm-hmm. that show then decided to leak the story, and awesome. basically they kicked him off their message board for other reasons, at around the same time. So, uh, you know, I can see how he would not trust us <laughs> or trust you based on, on that experience. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, uh, like I said. Because he was going to keep this quiet. He wasn't going to go public with this, at least not for now. You know, That's And the then this I, other, yeah, these yeah. other people jumped the gun completely. Lance is a skeptic. This is what skeptics do. They, they dig into this sort of thing. I don't know that I can really fault him. I, for one, I'm glad that he found this out, and I'm glad we know. Uh, however it comes out is how it comes out. Um, I mean, do I think it was unfortunate that it was leaked out the way it was without his input and without his, um, his, you know, the full battery of knowledge that he had about the situation? Yeah, I think that's uh, extremely unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, the hows and the whys who I don't care about the personalities. Let's just look at what we've got. And what we've got is extraordinarily problematic and, and unfortunately, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, Phil isn't the first. He won't be the last. You know, we going forward, if we have a guest that really bolsters credentials, we're going to try and do our best to look into that. Um, but I want our audience to do that, too. I want our audience to kind of um, unintrusively audience kind of uh, follow up. And maybe if you're that interested in something someone says, you're interested enough to check out uh, their background and try and verify that they are who they claim they are. Um, I mean, we can't do it all. We can't vet every guest. It's 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 it, that that adds hours and hours to right. show production. Yeah, we're not investigators week. here. We're, we're trying to do a you podcast. Know, I mean, this is the unfortunate right. thing. But I do want to add one thing because um, I think I said it on the show again. I can't remember what I said where, but I think I said on the show. Lance Moody, evil blogger who was trying to get Phil and Brogno. I might have said it on our forum. Um, and that he then had to shut down his blog or something. That was actually a different blogger. Um, there was someone named N- NYC Jeff, not Jeff Ritzman, obviously, right. uh, who had a, a website up uh, who had written an article called Im- Imbrogno's Imbroglio or something like that. <laughs> okay. And um, and that was the one that Phil and Rosemary Ellen Guiley were chiming in on uh, in the comments section. Mm. Uh, and that was about looking into his background. Um and they were commenting, and then that got taken down. 
Um, oh. you, you know, I'm assuming related to them. And that was when I had emailed Phil originally and said, you know, I'm sorry you're going through this. Uh, it sucks that someone would do that to you, you know, figuring Phil's on the level, of course. And so when it switched over to Lance Moody, in his email to me, it was all about Lance Moody. He made no mention of that first guy. So I assumed that they were the same person because I didn't oh. really pay attention to who was, you know, writing that originally. I just saw that somebody had and, and said, right. oh, sorry, you're going through this. Oh. Uh, so I assumed it was all Lance Moody because Moody was the one who was being credited with doing this investigation. And it turns out it was somebody else altogether. So. Wow. Uh, so, so Lance Moody never had anything up on his website. He never had it taken down. Uh, I just want to make that distinction. If it yeah. matters to anybody, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a point or not. I mean, it is what it is, and uh, uh, and it's and it's grossly disappointing uh, to me, at least, to look at the body of work that Phil did in his time in this. I mean, it. Uh, I mean, this is where I ask pretty much every audience member to really st- take a step back from. You know, the shock and the personality conflicts and the conflict horrors that surrounded all of this and, and and start to really look at what has Phil given to this field and what kind of worth do you place on it at this point in time, now, knowing what you know. And I, I mean for my money, I I have to I have to throw it out. I hate to say I have to throw it out because uh you know, I know Lee had mentioned something about babies and bathwater, but uh you know, when you take a piss in the bathtub Nobody wants to get in that tub. So, um, I mean, that's pretty much it for me. I've got to kind of put that stuff aside. It's not passing through the filter anymore. So um, I guess everybody has to make their own choice about that. But that's, that's, that's my feeling. What about you? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, just, I wish there were some way to verify for certain that Bad Boy 666 is Phil. Because It would be. Yeah, that would be great. If we, I mean, if we could do that, then I could talk about what he wrote to me because it would all be a moot point. Right. But since I can't verify that, I mean, I'll give him the same due as I did David Jacobs, which is we never actually yeah. read his private email on the air. We just said it's uh, pretty much the same thing that he wrote on his website, you know, however many weeks later. Right. Um, so there that's it is. Not, that's not really protecting anybody. It's no, just, no, no, no. It's just it's my own thing. Back. It's my own. He wrote to me in confidence, so I'm going to keep that confidence until such time as it is 100% proven that – that that's him, and and then it won't matter. He's giving anyway. completely different answers. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so anyway, our guest tonight. Yeah, speaking of trying to find credentials for future guests, we well, started with this guy, and he this said, is "What we did, yeah, yeah." If yeah. anyone wants to, you know, get his credentials from him, he's he's fine with that. So yeah, you can go to his website, which is MarianApparitionsAreReal dot com. His name is Kevin Cook. And he is uh, considered one of the most foremost authorities on Marian apparitions, and so this is something we haven't really um, haven't really talked about on the show at all. Is this uh, spiritual apparitions and all that, right? I mean, this is the first one. Uh, well, outside of Jacques Vallée, Wonders in the Sky. Uh, yeah, that touched a little bit on that. Yeah, but yeah, I I I, um, I, I kind of started asking for credentials uh, or proof of education with this guest and. Um, and basically, uh, his his masters won't fit in a fax machine <laughs> to be able to to send it. But he said, you know, anybody's welcome to contact him, and he's willing to provide anything you need to to vet him as the uh, academic guy that he is. So, at any rate, uh, we appreciate that from him. And so, uh, are we ready to roll? Yes, on with the show. Um, and you'll have a, a different microphone for the show. So, in case this microphone completely sucks, that's right. Uh, worry not, folks. Worry not. It's the Turtle Beach gaming headset. I left my mic at work, so. <laughs> for the professional outfit. He-Man in the background with me. You're on a gaming headset. I'm on a Halo headset. <laughs> let's, let's talk Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> God, here we go. Paratopia, without further ado, please welcome Kevin Cook. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on Paratopia to talk about Marian apparitions for the first time on this show. Well, I'm happy to do it. Now, I guess probably we should get the boring stuff out of the way, uh, the stuff that you've been asked 8 million times, uh, such as, how did you come into this? <laughs> well, actually, it's not that boring. Uh, I had a, <laughs> I've had kind of an X-Files kind of life, kind of, uh, more or less. I guess it was a prep for, for this. Um, I grew up uh, oh, in South Florida, and my father was a big electronics engineer down there, and uh, 
In essence, he did a lot of volunteer work for the Coast Guard. He hired all the boating uh, instructor courses, uh, boating instructor people for the boating courses for you know all the different cities in, in South Florida. And he hobnobbed with a lot of admirals in, in doing that. And also, he's a big defense contractor. He owned a major electronics company and uh, did a lot of work for the Defense Department. And I give this as a preface because uh, about that time was when the Bermuda Triangle uh, book came out by Charles Berlitz and and all that, and uh, you know, I was a young teenager, and I asked uh, Dad uh, if there's any validity to all these things, and he said, "I know you, you know, expect me to just dismiss it, but no, there actually is, and the, all kinds of stuff connected with the Bermuda Triangle is as real as real gets, and uh, and that was one issue, and then another issue in my childhood at the same era was uh, there was a movie, uh, The Ghost of Flight 401, with Ernest Borgnine, is kind of a classic movie where he was the um, oh the uh, navigator on an Eastern Airlines flight on L, a Lockheed L ten eleven flight, and it went down in the glades. And what happened was Eastern Airlines cannibalized the parts from the wreckage and reused them on other L ten eleven flights. And every flight they <laughs> reused the parts on was haunted with the ghost of this navigator. And that was the substance of the movie. And as it turns out, some of our neighbors in uh, Plantation, Florida, a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, were witnesses to the ghost. So, I mean, here at an early age, I got confronted with stuff that was a very exotic yet very valid. Well, and, uh, the the, I, the title of your book, Marian Apparitions Are Real, has an exclamation mark at the end. Is that a nod to flying saucers are real? Uh, well, no, uh, that really, no, not really. It was uh, just a title I liked, and uh, there's been other people that have written similar similar titles but but no um i guess I, when i when i put it in that in an emphatic sense was to basically you know be demonstrative that for my research into it there's every bit of validity to this this uh, phenomenon as a matter of fact what i contest is that uh of all the paranormal field out there this is the most well authenticated of any possible uh paranormal issue well, when we say well authenticated, what I guess that's sort of the deeper question we'll get into is what exactly has been authenticated. I know uh, the sightings, but does the meaning is the meaning authenticated? Do we know? Can we say for certain that this is what it portends to be? I think so. I think so. To the best of my knowledge, I think so. See, I've run across other issues on different shows, and different questions have come up, like. Uh, for example, uh, extreme uh, Protestant uh, fundamentalists would say, ah, oh, it's of the devil. Well, no, it isn't. That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, anybody who's familiar with Catholicism knows that we don't you know, worship Mary as such, as a goddess or anything. She's not trying to go into business for herself. And also, um, you know, as far as those that would say UFO con content to it, I, I don't buy that because there's no... Oh, there's no real evidence of that either. Um, well, have you read uh, Jacques Vallée's Wonders in the Sky by any chance? I've read some little excerpts from Jacques Vallée over the years, but not, not that particular book. No. Because that's his most recent. He has a catalog uh, of just things seen in the sky from antiquity on up, um, and he ends it when flight begins. So it's really interesting. And so a lot of it is, you know, uh, warriors in the field seeing battles of humans playing out in the sky. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, that sort of gives way to these Marian apparitions. Um, I mean, you could make the case that there are things um, that are seen in the sky. And then as culture grows, you know, it gives way to things sort of coming down and speaking to people. Yeah. Um, and then once we end up actually taking to the sky... Uh, in airplanes and the such, uh, then it goes right back to things in the sky again. It sort of resets itself, except this time the things in the sky yeah, are I think that's discs. really kind of speculative, really, because you got to understand, this has been going on for 2,000 years, and most of the sightings are not necessarily in the sky or anything. They're very one-on-one -on -one kind of associations. And uh, there's been as many as uh, 14 million people that have seen one particular sighting. Well, let's get into what what was the one that really appealed to you, and you said you connected with it and said, "Okay, this there's got to be something to this. I've got to investigate this." 
Well, it kind of culminated in uh, September of 2008. What I, I did was I, I have an upstate New York fascination, and I was looking for some property up there, pretty reasonable, reasonably priced. And, uh, you know, I looked at the property, spent a few days playing tourist, and the night before I was going to, or really a, a day and a half before I was going to fly out back home to Texas, I stopped over in Fultonville. It's a little town near Albany, about 40 miles westbound of Albany on Highway 90. And I said, well, I'll just set aside, uh, you know, that next day, Wednesday, just to, uh, you know, sightsee in the Mohawk Valley. And what happened was I uh, I ran across Our Lady of Martyr Shrine in Orysville, New York, within, you know, just a few minutes. And what I experienced there was very awesome. Uh, I was, like, I was there about an hour and a half, and for the first 45 minutes, I smelled an overpowering, you know, wrenching smell of roses and there weren't any roses except maybe 20 acres away you know i mean you know not even bloodhound could have smelled them and finally after experiencing this for such a long time um i went in and talked to the curator of the museum there and i said look lady i sell trees and plants for a living uh what all i see is pines maples this sort of thing nothing very fragrant and she said, you smelled it too and i said yeah i did i guess and she even showed me on the grounds of the uh shrines, about 80-acre plateau, where in all likelihood I smelled the, the smell in the strongest sense. And that was where the first rosary was said in this that part of the country uh, in 1642. That's a series of Catholic prayers connected with the Virgin Mary. And uh, what it was, this is such an awesome experience, because I've been me long enough to know when something unique happens, you know. And I don't have a great sense of smell. I, you know, I take Zyrtec and all that stuff. And just because I was in New York a couple of days didn't make me cured from the allergies necessarily. Mm-hmm. And uh, I knew I'd experienced something quite dramatic. And as it turns out, I did some research into it, and that's that's an experience which is replicated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times at Catholic shrines and connected with Catholic saints. It's called the odor of sanctity. And that was such a moving experience that, of course, I already had a pre-existing interest in Marian apparitions, and and upon looking into them, I found this odor of sanctity was part and parcel of many of the Marian apparition experience experiences. To what end? So that, do you know? I'm sorry. Do you know what? To what end? What's what's the point of having a phantom smell like that? Do you know? Uh, to be candid with you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I you know, I could, I'm I'm the expert at it, and I know I can't really say. And uh, but it just seems to be a phenomenon that's associated with Catholic saints. Uh, Padre Pio was a saint that uh, died in the '60s, and he he was a well-studied individual and so forth and so on. A lot of paranormal phenomena happened around him, and one of them was the odor of sanctity that kind of followed him around wherever he was. And uh, there was no cologne or no pedestrian explanation. So I guess what I'm saying is, that, you know. It, it was got getting smacked in the face with a tuna. I mean, this stuff exists. It's not superstition. It's not silliness. It's, it's a very valid experience. Okay, so as far as the actual visions themselves, um, is this something that you have uh, personally experienced? No, unfortunately, I haven't. No. Uh, like I said, I got led into it with my experiences I've had that were kind of on the periphery of it. But I did do uh, about a year and a half of research into it, and. Uh, I don't know, have you seen on the website or anywhere a copy of the book where uh, some of the pictures that are in it, like they're on the website? Yes. Well, if you saw that picture over that domed church in uh, Cairo, Zaytun, Egypt, Zaytun is a suburb of Cairo, uh, that was seen in the 68 through 1970 period by up to 14 million people on Arab television in Egypt, and, and millions saw it in person, too. This is a silent apparition as opposed to one where she speaks to the individual seer, witnesses or seers, what they call them. Uh, but it was had Vatican observers. Uh, uh, Time magazine was there, the New York Times, uh, Paris Match, uh, the German magazine, magazine Stern. I mean, there's reporters all through this. And uh, that was the most dramatic of sightings, even though it didn't have some of the other spicy elements to it, it like cures and prophecies and all that other stuff. Well, where in the Catholic Church is there room for cures and prophecies and, and all of that? I mean, I thought this was all sort of false idol stuff. No, no, it isn't. Uh, there's been, uh, 
Well, no, I mean, obviously, that has anything to do with false idol stuff at all, really. I mean, there's been, uh, all through history, there's been an- visions of angels and messengers and such and such, and it, it, it talked of uh, men prophesying in, in later times in the Bible. Uh, this is nothing that's unique uh, as opposed to the biblical times. And I, really, it makes sense, because, you know, uh <laughs> This is a spiritual world. There's a devil, there's angels, there's the whole nine yards. It's not like everybody went in the closet to, you know, and hiding over all these many years. See. Well, has there been a, sort of a cohesive message throughout the years, or has there been an evolving message? What what sort of message is there when these the things happen? to an extent consistent in, in that it's more or less what you might term preachy, what you'd expect a maternal uh, form of message as far as believing in Jesus as her son and adhering to prayer and being good to each other and all this kind of classical Christian type of message you'd expect. But there have been prophetic messages which have spoken of some pretty dramatic things, like uh, she appears frequently at very pivotal moments uh, in time. Uh, I could get into some of them with you, but... Uh, uh, a lot of what she says at, at, at a given pivotal moment in time is very uh, very impressive and adds a lot to the authenticity of the experience. Well, sure. Why don't we get into that? Well, the one of the most powerful uh, appearances was in 1531. Uh, you're probably familiar with this scene on the back of, uh, say, Mexican-Americans. A lot of them have the Our Lady of Guadalupe in the back of their truck. You know, right. but, Well, that is a image that uh, appeared on a cactus husk garment. An uh, Indian Catholic convert named Juan Diego was walking in the area of uh, a Tepeyac Hill, which is more or less the present site of Mexico City. Okay. And the Virgin Mary appeared to this Indian, and she said for him to go to the bishop and to tell the bishop that uh, you know she wanted a chapel built in that hill area. And... Uh, you know, he did this, trying to comply with her desires, and the bishop basically patted this guy on the head and said, well, thank you, buddy, I'm glad you talked to the Virgin Mary, uh, you're a kook, and <laughs> come back when you've got some proof, and that'll be that. And Which is, you know, kind of what you could expect. And he went, he saw her again, and she uh, she placed in his tilma, this cactus husk cloak is what it really is, a bunch of Castilian roses, and remember, this was December in Mexico City. It's high elevation. It's pretty cold. It's not any place where there's roses growing. And in 1531, there's no way you could speed them on over from Castile or anything. And he presented them to the bishop as a proof of her apparitional experience. And when she, he opened the cloak to present the roses, this image was on the back of this tulma, this cactus husk garment. Uh, that's, that is the symbol of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And more than that, I know for a fact that that engineers from Sandia Labs have taken fragments from that garment, which is on display to this day in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City, and there's no evidence of tracing and there's no pigment. This has been examined more than any more than the Shroud of Turin, more than any other artifacts you could come up with. Why do you think something like that is necessary? Because I think it's I think it's very necessary because people's faith is strained. Uh, they had uh, miracles in the Bible, but isn't that the point of faith? Isn't the point of faith that it's faith? Yeah, right. But I mean, that's why <laughs> Jesus, Jesus was uh, coming up with miracles every five minutes, and that was obviously to give people the inst- inclination that this is the real deal. So uh, I think obviously that people need a reminder. I know I did. I found it very helpful. Why do you think it's Mary in visions and not Jesus visions? Uh, actually, the book says uh, visits of Jesus and Mary. Jesus shows up in many of these apparitional events. Hmm. And it, when he shows up, it, is is there a clear uh, delineation in roles, or how does that work? Do, do they, if they show up together, is she a mother to him? Is he like what's that sort of relationship in the uh, vision? They basically don't show up at the same interval, but. Oh, there's basically it's it's a, a relatively limited role, but I mean he, it's more or less a powerful message that you know to to do one thing or another as far as uh, like for example he showed up at the apparitional event in Rwanda uh, 
there's a book, Our Lady of Cabejo, that's out on the market, and that uh, dealt with uh, an approved apparition by the church in Rwanda in the 1990s, and others. And uh, b- basically, the messages that come through in these events are pretty classical, what you could expect. Uh, there's nothing that's anti-biblical or anti-Christian in message, nothing offbeat, except what well, there have been some demonically inspired apparitions, but very few. Very few. Uh, how does one tell the difference? Well, the one in Bayside, New York, was coming up with all kinds of kooky, uh, offbeat uh, pronouncements that weren't very Christian, and, uh, and there was actually uh, a bunch of weird kind of poltergeisty activity around the place, and there actually turned to be some uh, exorcisms connected with that at uh, apparitional event. But like I say, that's extremely rare. And what was the first uh, Marian apparition do you, that, that you can trace back? The first uh, recorded Marian apparition is Our Lady of the Pillar that happened in Sargasso, Spain in uh, 41 AD. And that's uh, where the Virgin Mary was still living. And she appeared to uh, the Apostle James, who was evangelizing the Spaniards in that area and having a tough time doing it. And basically, she appeared to him to buoy him up and, uh, you know, Basically, keep you know, tell them to keep going and not be discouraged. Would it bother you um, if this turned out not to be uh, what it appears to be? Sure, but I'm convinced more than I need to be that it's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have any problems like that. What convinces you of that? Well, th- the reason I wrote the book is I was impressed with the length and breadth of the uh, evidence. I'd like that shot of... Uh, that, uh, not the Shroud Trend, brother, but the image on that tilma I, I talked to you about, and the number of witnesses and the millions, uh, something that's been reported for 2,000 years, prophecy that's turned out exactly right. Uh, and I must also say, you know, uh, you don't have to believe in Marian apparitions or their validity to be a Christian or a Catholic either. That's not, it's not required. But uh, I feel very certain that it's, it's valid as all get up. Is there any one that stands out to you as um, sort of the incontrovertibly uh, sort of this is it, you can't deny this um, in terms of not just physical evidence, but even, say, prophecy? I mean, is there one that has all of the elements uh, that you would you would want in this well, type of thing? Well, uh, the physical evidence is really unparalleled in the Guadalupe one. The prophecies that were found in... Uh, our Lady of Fatima, where she appeared to three young children in Portugal, and that she, uh, you know, these are basically uh, semi-literate uh, children, you know, agrarian children, and she described them about Russia in 1917, and she described to uh, Sister Lucia, who was the primary seer, that, uh, you know, Russia would you know, have errors that would cause disruption in the world. It's basically a precursor to the rise of communism and the Russian Revolution. And these children knew nothing of Russia. They couldn't find it on a map if you held a gun to their head. And uh, and all these things were well, well recorded at the time by the local, you know, people in that area and reporters and everything else. I mean, it wasn't like this was made up in whole cloth thereafter or anything like that. And uh, in essence... Uh, that plus some prophecies connected with uh, a, a second and greater war, because they were in the First World War at that time, and they, she indicated there would be another second war, which was an allusion to World War II. And just uh, quite a few things were very incontrovertible. Uh, also, it came to a culminating point in October of 1917, where they had the, a prophesied, a uh, miracle because you know people were asking for a genuine card-carrying miracle, and she—that was where they had the dance of the sun. They had a hundred thousand people in a plane uh, called the Cova de Ira, and uh, it was raining like mad, and they were waiting overnight for this apparitional event. Uh, a lot of the crowd was made up of components of people trying to debunk the apparition, actually, because the government in Portugal was a socialist government, which was basically anti-clerical and was trying to, oh, basically brand the church as being preservers of the status quo, you know, the rich elite and the poor peasants, blah, blah, like that. And well, what, was, what do you do with the fact that, that people reported different things? I mean, some people reported what you could say are, you know, UFO activity. No. No? What do you mean, no? no. 
Yeah, they did. What are you talking about? No, no they didn't either. The, the dance of the sun as far as celestial things. They didn't have like a ship, like a flying saucer in any accounts I've read. Well, wait a minute. You, you must have read accounts of people seeing different things that day. Not some people saw they the sun. Some them people, but nothing in the classical UFO sense. No. Huh. <laughs> well, uh, do you want me to? Do yeah, you want me to break off the interview right now? Because I'm telling you the truth, and I'm not going to have any cynicism from some some guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. I uh, I don't really want you to break off the interview now, but I think that there might be some deeper issues involved uh, meaning, that it seems like you might not be open to. I don't think it's a demonic thing, if that's what you're trying to do. And I've studied it. No, no, more. no. I don't, I don't know about demonic. I mean, my book is, is on the bibliography of the International Marriott Research Institute. It's, I'm considered the, probably the top expert or one of the top experts in the world on this. And uh, I'm not going to be made fun of. No, no, I'm not making fun of you. No, I, 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 I don't say fine, But I'm not going to have a lot of snide nonsense from somebody that's never really busted a gun. No, Kevin, 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 I think I think w- what this is stemming from is is Fatima. In many cases that I've read, and I've been in this 25 years, a lot of it very much smells like a UFO sighting. In fact, you know, when you're talking about a disc covering the sun or a disc the size of the sun, something now, like that. In a, in a globe know. of light uh, and, and La Salette. But uh, it basically, what I have read is basically the sun seemed to uh, dance in the sun, of what they call right. it, like it, it acted in an erratic form. But there's also so many other facets to this that were separate, distinct from whatever celestial displays. These people just tried to explain it in the best way they could. Sure. And, uh, I mean, they didn't know what airplanes were. So what I'm saying, or very little, and so what I'm saying is the only reason I think, in my opinion, which is just an opinion, that people grasp onto this UFO thing like George Norrie so strongly is because it's easier for them to relate to UFOs, to believe in UFOs than something that, that would be divine, because it's just more comfortable to them psychologically. Well, it's, not, deno- it's not denominational. <laughs> I well, mean, it's not threatening either. If God's right. yeah, exactly. out yeah. to somebody, I mean, everybody with any brains would believe that there's UFOs because there's been sure. too much smoke uh, to not have some fire in there somewhere Absolutely. over many years. I, you know, I go to UFO conferences. It interests me. But right. what I'm saying is, uh, so yeah, I think there's plenty to it. But no, I don't think. You have a 2,000-year-old phenomenon with all kinds of fascinating and very intricate in relations with the Virgin Mary right. and one potential uh, description that may or may not be a UFO is not going dis- to not going to deter the whole phenomenon from having validity mm, no I don't think it would either um, talking hundreds and hundreds probably it's been estimated as many as 2,500 2,700 apparitions no the thing the thing that I was balking at is that I couldn't understand that you haven't heard that explanation oh, I'm before. familiar with it, but the, the descriptions are so vague and hazy, you could be talking about a lot of things. You'd be talking about ball lightning, for goodness sakes. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, nothing that was the classical, yes, there's a disc in the sky, like, uh, you know, uh, the guy in 1947 or whatever, well, no, what was it, George Adamski or something like that. Oh, no, nothing like that, no. No, I'm not but in the class. What, you're talking, what, I'm, yeah. what I'm getting at is, you know, it's a very vague description, Mm-hmm. But people fasten on that like with like with both claws, mm-hmm. and, and they're ignoring ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the the experiences in this phenomenon. That's what I'm saying. Well, well, at Fatima, I mean, let me just ask what um, what is the classical description uh, from start to finish that that you've been able to kind of either piece the together from a bunch class- or you yes, know. the witness's classical descriptions has been. The sun seemed to dance in the sky. It even seemed to be coming down towards the populace there. Okay, okay. and they were scared because they didn't know what. Obviously, something bizarre was happening, and they didn't know what was up. Mm-hmm. That is basically the nuts and bolts of the description that's been ascribed to it. Mm-hmm. But also some other things. That, I mean, the prophecies had nothing to do with a bunch of aliens. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, <laughs> the all the cures that were associated with it that came from that were alleged to have come from that experience that had nothing to do with aliens mm. also the people were soaking wet on this plane a hundred thousand people and they were all of a sudden miraculously dry mm. that's a phenomenon that's well attested to uh also interestingly of the of the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of very skeptical uh reporters that were set there to debunk it 
nobody really debunked it. None. And this happened over. This has happened because I'm. You have to, you're talking to somebody who's completely unfamiliar with with most Marian apparition stuff. But yeah. was Fatima many days or one day? It was a monthly experience over monthly. about a twelve or thirteen month period. Yeah. Okay. And the sun yeah, dancing in the sky, all of that happened on a monthly basis. Well, no, no, no. It kind of culminated. Most of these were it just... It culminated with that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they had asked, the people had been asking for and had relayed to the seers, asked the Virgin Mary for a, a sign, a sign, like they always do. Right. And that, and that was promised that on this day there would be this issue, and that was, you know, celestial displays, whatever it was. And that's what happened. Now, now let and, me ask you this, because this is, this is a really curious thing for me, um, because, and, and in a way, this this kind of fits in with other paranormal things that I've heard, if you want to classify this as paranormal, which I do. Um, in, in the sense of the people watching at Fatima, all these people gathered together, they, they see this unbelievable thing occur. Yeah. Was this, I mean, it would stand to reason that people perhaps hundreds of miles away would have seen something uh, in that direction, were in surrounding areas. Did did people report anything in those vast surrounding areas around that area? To the best of my knowledge, no. See, that's interesting. That's really interesting to me because and remember, this is a very rural you know, area too. Sure, sure. Um, but when I mean, when you're talking about the sun dancing around in the sky, you know. One would immediately think. Oh, I know what uh, you're saying. I know, but but as a matter of fact, it seemed to be very localized. Now, also, you're saying uh-huh. about one of the things that's been seen. One of the prophecies that was very intriguing that Mary relayed to these children was the Second World War that was alluded to would be preceded immediately preceded by a great light being seen in the sky mm. in Europe, and they had just before. Uh, uh, you know, Hitler was at his uh, Birchis Garden retreat, mm-hmm. and there was a tremendous, unbelievable, uh, unprecedented display of the Aurora Borealis in the late 30s. And Hitler saw this and recognized this as the sign that now that we can begin, or if you will. And uh, this was uh, basically what the kickoff was to World War II. And this was prophesied to Sister Lucia in, this, in the messages that were given to her. Huh. Now, this as far was an as unprecedented uh, uh, example of the order by all, much, and that was seen all over Europe. But anyway, yeah. uh, as far as the, the dancing of the sky and the, the sun in the sky, no. That was and a very localized same, thing. Yeah, and that same phenomenon, in a lesser degree, was experienced at Batania in the 1990s, eight, late 80s, early 90s. At, uh, hmm. They had a series of apparitions in Venezuela, and they, uh, they've had similar celestial displays, and they had similar celestial displays in Rwanda in the 1990s as well. So, it's, in other words, this has been repeated several times. But yeah, in, all these, in all these various instances, it's never been like this, the typical UFO or anything like that, no. Right, right. I mean, it, the, the um, thing that really interests me about it is that a lot of UFO sightings that are, if you want to call them mass, or even if they're just an uh, individual or, or a small group of people, four or five, uh, you kind of get that same localized, almost uh, tunneled uh, vision of them yeah. uh, stepping to one side or the other. I mean, as much as three steps, which I've seen myself, the thing is not there. And then you step three right, steps right. back and there it is again. It's this very – it's here for you. It's this is for you and you only. Right, um, right. Very personalized type of experience, which I think is interesting, especially when you're talking about thousands of people. I know. Uh, well, yes, I know. And that's very that's a very good point. It, but um, it, it is, you know, quite striking, and you know, there there is a lot of disparity in a lot of these marine apparitions. I mean, some are to one individual, like Bernadette, mm, right? Lourdes, uh, and some are like that. But one I just mentioned about Zaytun, Egypt, is uh, you know, was in front of fourteen million people in essence. I mean, over a protracted two year period, right? Well, so, I, I wanted mean, to ask you about that one the um, the photograph that's on your your homepage. Yeah, uh, that's the one on the right for listeners kind of following along here. I mean, um, is there video of that anywhere? Is there f- actual motion footage of that any place, or is it just stills that, that came we have? Off Arab television. Hmm. And it was well. I mean, it's there's no uh, copyrights on it at this point because it was so old and also right. so well distributed. And what year what was I'm this? Saying, I'm sorry. Uh, it was th- it was over. This happened three to five times a week. 
in front of Saint, uh, at St. Mark's Coptic Church in Zaitun, Egypt, suburb of Cairo, from 1968 through 1970. And it had another spate of uh, similar apparitions in another suburb, Warik El Hadar in uh, Cairo, that happened in fall of 2009. So there should, by all rights, there should be motion footage of this somewhere. There's YouTube on the one in, from 2009 on the, uh, or was on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. But, but as far as the one from Cairo? Uh, yes, yes, yes. It, it's out there. I mean, did that apparition, did it, did it move at all? Yes. I mean, it, is, it does appear to be free-floating. And, um, yes, and I, mean, I, well, I mean, I'm looking at a still on a website, so it's hard to tell what's right, sure. actually going actually, on. But, thing, you know, one of the it looks like you think. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It looks like th- you've definitely got reflected light on the dome behind her. So she looks like she's probably halfway to three quarters of the way down the edge of that slope uh, because there's an, an, an enormous amount of light underneath the the figure and behind it to its right, not so much to its left. Um, you know, which leads me to think that it's something physical that's there that's casting this indirect light, especially on the. I guess that's an. Uh, Either across or an eagle above that's on the the spire. Um, I mean that's very well lit up um, and appears to be free floating. So um, there's a corollary I, to that I was going to tell you about. Is that sure at the time you got on, at the nine nineteen sixty eight they had another strong man in power at that time. His name was Nasser, and he's basically a client of the Soviets. You know, their man in Egypt and. What it was, was he was a Muslim in name only, you know, not really, just kind of had to be to be president, but not a real practicing Muslim. And certainly wasn't a Christian. He wouldn't emphasize anything that would, you know, endorse Christianity. All right. That said, uh, Nasser sent special force, Egyptian special forces troops, block by block, door by door, a mile square around that church in Cairo to see if there's any kind of chicanery or you know, holographic projection or anything like that, found nothing. At the end of his investigation, even this Nasser, the president of the, com- the country, said it was a valid and, ex- and true experience mm. from yeah. Mosul. I think that's yeah. pretty dramatic itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it. it um, I mean, certainly, uh, I'm not... I mean, I did stage production for a number of years. I mean, I could say it's a scrim, but where in the hell would you put it? Where would you hang the scrim? Uh, uh, I don't see any way that you're going to put them up there well, so and actually have with that. The crowd. This was interactive with the crowd. Oh, so what did it do? I mean, it, it was, was non-speaking, like you said, but right? Like if, if someone you know screamed out to them, they would wave at them, <laughs> or at least acknowledge it with a you know, nod of the head or something like that. I mean, in other words, it wasn't just a flat, static figure, no. Right. Uh, well, it, did this have any, I mean, it, it, you can't really tell from this photograph here, but did it have any facial features and folds in clothing or anything some like that? The, uh, some of the write-ups I've read have said at different times you could discern the feminine features in her face more readily and so forth. Huh. Um, what about the picture to the left on your homepage? Where, where is that? Okay, now that was... Okay, now is that of a woman on a hill? Um, it looks like a it looks like the top of a pine tree. And oh yes, yes. Okay, yeah, that was taken in Medjugorje. That's okay. a. Uh, of course, they've had apparitional sightings there for thirty years that the church is investigating now with its own commission to determine the validity of it. Okay. But uh, what happened was uh, the church I go to. Uh, one of the ladies knew I was writing a book about Marian apparitions. And she says, I've got something for you. And her companion, she and this companion had gone on a pilgrimage to Medjugorje, several of them. And one of the ones she went on, this woman took a picture of, of that hill. It's uh, Mount Podpro, I think they call it. Okay. And w- what it amounts to is that image was what was on the film after the film was developed. And they say, well, I'm crazy. Well, that's what she said. And uh, th- nobody's making any money out of it. And if you've written any books, you know that you don't make any much money anyway. Right. But what I'm saying is, this was this is on, in this woman's office. She works for the church itself. She's mm-hmm. uh, like you know works in the liturgy, and her husband's a Catholic deacon. In other words, salt of the earth type people. And like I say, they just I I saw the I I quizzed them very strongly on the validity of the picture, and it is. I mean, nobody like I say, nobody's making any dough of this. It just is a really bizarre picture. 
Yeah. And that, that image of Mary was not on the, all they did was originally was take a picture of the hill where the apparition supposedly occurred initially. And right. there's no good reason why that, that, uh, that would be on the film. Huh. Um, you know. and, I mean, I was uh, just going to say by all rates to me, that looks like, I mean, if you ask me just straight off the cuff at first blush, no, no, it looks like um, it looks like a standard double exposure of a statue. Yeah, you know, okay. I can. I, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. You know, and like I say, I don't. I didn't have you know electric cattle prize to, to, <laughs> you know, to use on yeah. or anything. Yeah. But, but also, once again, the thing about back to the Cairo one, mm-hmm. uh, they had Vatican observers there. They had observers from. The Egyptian Coptic Church, which is where the uh, vision occurred over, that's an Eastern Orthodox version of Catholicism in uh, in Egypt, long-standing, old, ancient denomination. At any rate, all kinds of church officials and every other guy walking around trying to debunk it. Nobody could, even the president couldn't. And there, you know, this is Egypt, 1968. They didn't have holographic projection equipment. I mean, we might have it now, but just barely. And they certainly did it in that backwater place, you know, almost 50 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, it, uh, you know, what I'm getting at, guys, is I know healthy skepticism is, is important, and I understand that. Sure. But there comes a time when, you know, you got to understand a little bit about me, too. I'm an ex-Army sergeant. I'm an old line salesman. I'm just a hard, muscle-bound old buzzard, okay? <laughs> okay. I'm a martial artist. I mean, I'm just a hard guy. I've been in knife fights, uh, brawls. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just not the average guy. And if I, something affected me so strongly, like in New York, believe me, it happened. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and I'm saying, yeah. And, I mean, there's no, there's no, yeah. I'm sorry. There's, there's no questioning that um, you know, experiences like this is, have got to be extraordinarily powerful. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the the thing that. Um, I'm curious about and see uh, my my own. I mean, you're obviously a, a, a man who uh, are you Catholic? Is that did I understand yeah. that right? So, I mean, I grew up Roman Catholic, and and I be honest with you, I don't really go to church anymore. Um, I, I see a kind of a larger picture of religion and God uh, that that kind of speaks to me in a different way these days. Um, in in so much as that, I don't know. Religion, to a point, seems um, well. This would be a given. Too small to really describe the nature of what God in reality and its interaction with us is. I'm and so I'm, you know, I kind of go that direction these days. So I'm, uh, but I see these tangents that kind of run through paranormal stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were talking about Fatima and the connection with UFO stuff. And I mean, certainly when you tear it down to bare bones, um, it, it, an unknown object in the sky doing crazy maneuvers could be considered yeah. a u- ufologically related. But right. um, something like this thing in Egypt that is um, a, like a haloed figure uh, at times that, that seems to have feminine features to it and all of that um, – I haven't looked that far into it, so I can't really speak on any authority image-wise. But um, what was going on in Egypt during that period? Was this a really turbulent time there? Was it a time of upheaval? It it was. Remember, there was the 1967 uh, Israeli-Egypt war Mm -hmm. uh, that just had just ended and, you know, could have broken out again any minute. Mm -hmm. And there is a pivotal timing to her showing up, and, you know, it could be – you know, it could be alleged that the likelihood, you know, this is here again, the subjective, but the, the likelihood of her showing up was kind of, you know, because understand, too, this episode completely enthralled the whole country of Egypt. I mean, right. for two years, I mean, I, we're talking as many as a quarter million people were in that square three to five times a, a week uh-huh. for two years. That's all anybody talked about. Sure. So what I'm saying is the whole country's focus was on Mary and, and religious miracles and not let's go kill the Jews kind of right. Thing. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, but see, I guess I didn't mean to lose my mind on you a minute ago, but what I'm getting at is even Nori and I, George Nori and I go round and round about this, about the coast to coast guy about, you know, well, at La Salette, she showed up in a globe of light. It could have been a UFO. Well, listen, 
I mean, how many? I mean, how do you know how the Virgin Mary shows up? Uh, uh, Hey, hey, uh, uh, hey, Kevin, let me tell you something. This is a guy who asked Jacques Vallée, Jacques, could they have been angels? Yeah, uh, yeah in so- fact, I find this ironic because I actually got kicked off Nori's show when I told him <laughs> about a UFO I saw, and he asked me if it could have been angelic, and I thought he was kidding. And uh, so I'm shocked that he goes the other way with you. That's weird. Well, I yeah. like George, and I'll probably be back on the show. I don't want to say anything and make him mad, and I, I owe George a lot, but uh, – and this was one instance, I guess what I'm trying to say is not to knock George, because I love George, but what I'm trying to say is you got to look at the depth and the the richness of this experience and this whole study. I mean, to just fasten on the Fatima aerial displays mm-hmm. is just the smallest part of it. See? Mm-hmm. I, oh, I mean, sure, yeah. Like a whole tapestry of stuff with the prophecies, the timing, the phenomenal number of witnesses, uh, miracle cures just out the wazoo. I mean, we're talking about real smoke and fire here. Can I ask you, do you know how the Catholic Church goes about uh, authenticating, like you said, metagorgy? They're, they're still working on it. How do they, what do they do? What's their process? Okay, the process, like in everything else they do, is incredibly laborious and tedious. Uh, what they do, like in most investigations, they interview the witnesses, for, and look into their backgrounds as far as whether uh, they have, you know, they're habitual liars or the credible people or subject to mental disorder, you know, de- determine you know where they're coming from, and they uh, not just the initial witnesses, but any tangential witnesses around. What did you see? Did you see this? You know, any, any physical evidence? In other words, they, they have a very long-standing commission. A bishop will set up a commission that'll really get down to brass tacks about. Uh, what happened, and they'll get testimony from anybody that you could even come close to having anything to add. And of course, they chronicle whatever was said and written down, like any prophecies, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's a very laborious process. And uh, the first uh, level of acceptance would be before a determination is made is is it worthy of, that they could determine that it's worthy of devotional expression? In other words, if if you want to make a pilgrimage to this area, uh, you can. We're not, you know, exactly buying into it, but still, you can. And the, the second and more uh, complete designation would be that it's of supernatural nature. In other words, Mary really came. This is a real deal. The evidence is irrefutable, as best could be determined. In the back of my book is uh, a uh, index I got from the uh, Marian Research Institute and in University of Dayton. Uh, it delineates Marian apparitions from the year 1900 to the present day, a little over 110 years. And in most of them, there is no determination made as far as whether they're valid or invalid, uh, just a very handful. And uh, that's pretty well the way it is throughout. I mean, uh, and, and, but you see, most investigations are that way anyway. I mean, I've heard jokes about the FBI. They couldn't find people if they were in a phone booth with them. I mean, you know. <laughs> In other words, if they're going to make a determination, it has to be pretty strong and hard, yes. Hmm. What um, Would someone from the church have to witness something firsthand, do you think? Would that be the end-all, be-all of, that guys, this is legit? That thing, but in most of these, that has not been the case. Most of the, it's has not happened? Okay. In very rare cases, it's been mostly at Sears. Uh, frankly, a lot of them are agrarian, peasant women in France. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the Egypt uh, apparition, I mean, that yeah. that was obviously seen by somebody from the Vatican or somebody. Yeah, the, yeah, the Coptic Church, the, and uh, reporters just crawling all over the place. And, yeah, uh, and, they, and they said that that was definitely something legit. Nothing has ever, been, nothing has ever and I, I've looked for this, because, you know, I'm not going to stand behind something I feel is, is wishy-washy mm-hmm. and not put two years of my life into writing a book if I think it's a bunch of baloney. And uh, I'm con- I never found one, not one negative. Oh, that's a bunch of malarkey. No, I never did. Mm. Even, like I say, even as President Nasser came out and endorsed it. And, mm. you know, uh, that's pretty hard to do in, in a Muslim country, you know. I mean, uh, but it happened. Has there ever been any Marian apparitions, in your opinion, that after you've read about them in depth, yeah. have you seen any that are so strong a story and then towards maybe the end or maybe some tangential um, description, 
there is a an aspect of it that almost seems to I don't know dethrone itself or to negate itself in some right, way right. or or it, does that play in here at all? There have been some and I don't you know I don't want to talk out of turn cuz I don't know everything about Medjugorje cuz not all of it's been left out for investigation examination but uh one of the problems in Medjugorje is the 30 year uh well the 30 year duration of the apparitions and also different people different times and there is a potentiality and I'm not saying it's true or not I mean it's not my call but I mean there's been some people like the local bishop who said some negative things about you know he he doesn't buy into it or whatever uh-huh. and that's why the church has f- formed a commission with this cardinal Ruini to come to grips with the reality of it but that may be one where it was initially true and the later apparitions were not I'm just speculating now I'm mean, right. I can't say much more than that. But the Bayside, New York one, which has pretty well gone down as the A number one uh, <laughs> exorcist ridden uh, uh, demonic uh, apparition. Uh, and also, it's interesting, I was on a show, uh, you may have heard of it, New England Ghosts up there in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Paul Eno, behind the paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Okay. And, and uh, we talked about that event in Bayside, New York, and. Uh, Paul was actually knew the Warrens who were exorcists and also Catholics, and they they were aware of demonic connection with it. But that that is an apparition that initially looked squared away and then started going loose around the edges pretty quickly. Huh. And there's been others. There's uh, to an extent uh, that I don't know this for a fact here once again either. But the one in Conyers in the 1990s, early 1990s, I think that uh, that has had some uh, negative aspects connected with it. Or said to have. Spurious what? Uh, yeah. What do you? Um, uh, where do I start here with this? Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at a, a really nice big scan of this uh, of this image. Yeah. Um, and and the caption underneath of it says, "Our picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe, not painted by any human hand." Um, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, how is that? Um, how is that remember, determined? Yeah, remember when I said that it had been examined by Sandia Labs engineers, and it had mm-hmm. to find evidence of tracing or pigment, and they couldn't find either one. And not only that, there's another little twist to this that's pretty unique. Is okay. They've had 20 different ophthalmologists examine the Virgin Mary's eyes in this image. Okay. Okay. When you and I look at each other, our eyes uh, are, have curved lenses, and they form a distortion effect called the Samson-Purkinje effect, which is basically just a distorted image in a lens, okay, caused by a curve. Okay, the Virgin Mary's eyes show three people standing in front of her with the same Samson-Purkinje effect. Twenty different ophthalmologists have examined this element, just her eyes, that has been looked under microscopes, okay. and and. It, it, it replicates what a human's eye would reflect. In other words, what I'm saying is this is beyond what an artist can replicate. I guarantee you in the 1500s, they wouldn't know any more about the Samson-Purkinje effect than they'd know about, you know, Craig computers. So we're, we're talking about anatom- anatomical uh, nature of the human eye is what you're saying, right? Yes, yes. And if there's no pigment in this, what is making up the color? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I, that's a good question. That, that's what makes the mystery to it. But, uh, and, and what I, material is this on? I'm sorry. It, it's, it's cactus on, husk. Cactus husk. Cactus husk. Yeah, just basically um, woven cactus husk. Because if they're looking at this underneath a microscope um, and, and they're not seeing pigment, they're just seeing cactus husk that is colored. Right. There is no pigment on top of the husk. Am I exactly. correct? Pigment just lays like a like a coating on the surface, right? Correct. Um, okay, so I, mean, I know it's hard to grasp, but I, I'll buy that. But I mean, I've read so much research on it; it's well available. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, it's very dramatic. Is there no? Um, have they found any sort of strokes at all? Is there any? I mean, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing um, uh, more or less like a. I guess it's a halo around her. Um, 
kind of looks like the inside of a, a mollusk shell, like a, a, a like a seashell type pattern around her. The only summary I can have I have of it is they found no evidence of a tracing, like you know all artists will make a little tracing and then mm-hmm. put in. and there's no element of pigment. Now, as far as any brush strokes, I'm not familiar with any. Uh, no, I mean I don't I don't really know how this this garment got to be the way it is. Yeah. And also another side kicker to it is. Consider what it's made of is is very fragile material. Yeah. And it's in pristine condition. It's only been under glass for the last 150 years. It's been subject to heat, cold, moisture, even uh, terrorist activity in 1920. Somebody tried to blow it up. Right. And it's in pristine condition. Now, that's pretty remarkable if it was just regularly painted. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what I'm saying is that's what I said to preface this, that some of the evidence is so strong in this and so well studied that it, I, okay, a guy that wrote the recommendation for the book, uh, Dr. Tim Barth, he's a, oh, he's head of the psychology department at TCU, he's a Catholic ghost hunter, just a big academic, all that. Okay. Uh, he is amazed at the level of evidence that there is in Marian apparitions compared with other areas of the paranormal, because like I say, he dabbles in ghost hunting and this and that. But he, he, he's amazed at this level of stuff, like the study of this garment, compared with people, you know, ooing and eyeing over what, an orb, which could be, you know, a little speck of light. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you know, at least you garments. got something in, you got, you got something in hand here. I mean, that's a yeah, little different. You got something to look at. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he, and of course, all the whole other dimensions of it—the prophecies, the cures, or this, or that—that uncommon, unnatural knowledge, like that girl sister Lucia would have about the Russian Revolution. What you know, this kid don't even know where Russia is. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, probably couldn't spell Russia. I mean, let alone Russia and its errors. And uh, she certainly wouldn't know about the Aurora Borealis and anything else living in Portugal. So. It, you know, some of these things are really quite striking and very well authenticated and, you know, chronicled at the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, speaking of things that are uh, really well preserved, aside from this cactus husk, uh, St. Bernadette. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> in the book. I know. She's actually I mean, my patron saint. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we're going to put a, a photograph probably up on our message board of St. Bernadette, uh, born 1844, died 1879. Um, I saw this on television not horribly long ago. There was a program, and I want to say it was Sci-Fi Channel, but I, for some reason I'm thinking that's wrong. It's probably History Channel. Yeah. Um, they had a pardon my <laughs> pardon my uh, memory. I can't I can't remember the name of the show. Well, devastating, the devastatingly cute host. I remember that she was a real looker, but yeah. I don't remember what the name of the show was. But was, they, was, the term, was the term what they called her the incorruptibles? Uh, I think so. I think so. I mean, they she went to where Saint Bernadette is is laid out in her gold yeah, and, and class coffin and all that, and and looked at her, and they had her on video for a very long time, and you were able to really look at right. just about every angle of her face, and it's ridiculous. It um, and also understand she was dug up about fifteen years after she died. Right. And then she was dug up yet again. Her body's flexible. That, there's a book that was written called The Incorruptibles by Joanne Cruz. Mm-hmm. It came out in 1977. It's still in print. And she chronicles 103 different examples of where bodies just did not decay in the normal sense. Mm-hmm. Now, Bernadette has a little wax on her face. It's not a wax mask. It's just a little wax because of discoloration. But that's it. Right. I mean, she has not rotted. No, she's and, got uh, makeup on, apparently. I mean, that's really all it boils oh, yeah, down to yeah, yeah. makeup. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, as far as just rotting like an old skull there, it's, it hasn't happened. And she's not no. been embalmed. And there's others. Uh, Joanne Cruz's book makes good reading. Uh, there's others. There, uh, there's a Russian Orthodox monk named Marmaluf or something like that. And uh, he was his body was actually partially underwater, and he did not deteriorate. Right. I mean, which is really remarkable stuff. Well, they did say something in that a program about that, that uh, that something within the Earth uh, in that particular area acts as a uh, some kind of preserving agent. But when you see other examples of that preserving agent that they were showing, 
Uh, and even when they're talking about St. Bernadette, there was something in there about the ground that she was interred in was – there was something unique about it. But even yeah, still, but I can't imagine – I mean, even when you look at the, some of the – ones like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you look at some of these things that um, – uh, like there's a – I think it's called the Wax Man or the Soap Man. I can't remember what it is, but he's in the Mutter Museum, I think. And there's a guy that – I forget how many – years old that he is but he is he is essentially made of uh, soap uh, the the ground that he was interred in was oh yeah 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 was impregnated I've heard, with I've heard uh, a, a chemical reaction happens with the body yeah, I understand. you look I've at saint bernadette it ain't uh, happening that way no, i mean i'm sorry thing, no. uh no, it's not she the same looks thing. she's laying in this thing and um and and this woman looks like she was laid down last night I know, I know. <laughs> they take more pictures of her because she's prettier anyway. But what it is... Yeah, is, she's a good-looking girl, yeah. But there's yeah. 103 different examples of this and in different parts of the world. And why mm-hmm. is an old Louis the Rapist, why, is, why isn't he uncorruptible if it's just a matter of uh, elements in the earth, you know? Right. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, I say we didn't dig him up. Well, maybe so. But there's lots of people under the... In Paris, underground Paris, where there's skulls piled up on skulls that deteriorated just fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in other words, I don't know. I mean, I I believe this is a miraculous event, but this is one I'll just have to, you know, just have to accept what it is. Well, but what what about Saint Bernadette? What did she um, what did she experience in her life that would have led to whatever this is? I mean, barring that there's not a scientific reason why she's not decomposing. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not of the – I'm not one of these people who says uh, this is completely unexplainable. I say this is something maybe we can't explain yet. Maybe we can't explain it at all. But uh, you know, it, 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 it's very, very interesting to me. Um, and I, I, I mean as much as this is not going to happen, it would be great if science was allowed in there to take some kind of very small coral sample to oh, – to be able to tell what's going on within her pigment and her skin and all of that that is not allowing this to happen. Oh, I uh, understand. I understand. But what but happened kind of back in her thing. life? What did she experience that would have led to something like this? Well, she's basically an innocent soul, if you will. Uh, she came from a poverty-stricken background, uh, just very, uh, oh, very Christian-oriented. Uh, her whole life was just, uh, you know, to become a nun, mm-hmm. in essence. I mean, that was her, one of her sisters was a nun, and, and I, as I recall, uh, of course, she, before she entered the convent, she experienced this apparition. But I guess basically an innocent soul, if you will. I mean, it was why did she deserve this kind of treatment, or why she selected out for this special treatment? Uh, right. So I would say a guileless, innocent soul type, and okay. I think that's why Mary, at least, it's just an assessment and just a guess, but that's why Mary has appeared to a lot to peasant children in France because they were fairly sweethearted and not worldly, if you will. Mm. And uh, as far, I don't know what, you know, Bernadette necessarily was a sa- uh, saintly person in herself. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Uh, it seems like she was just a good-hearted type. Uh, so she was never like an apparition witness or spoke to the Virgin Mary or anything? Oh, she like did that. see the Virgin Mary, yes. She, she was, did? Yes, she okay. was see her at Lourdes. Okay. Okay. And the Virgin Mary told her where to dig, and, and here's another little weirdness. Uh, the Virgin Mary told her where to dig during one of these appearances, and it, at first it started to be a trickle. It turned out to be like something like 20,000 gallons of water a day came out of what was a trickle, and right. where the Virgin Mary told her to, to dig in front of a lot of witnesses, and which was and striking. And because uh, the Virgin Mary said there'd be a stream that she was consecrating to her and blah, 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 for Bernadette to dig there, and that's what happened. And uh, that was the substance of it. But that, and, and Lourdes, that was a apparitional event that had but one witness. And, and that was St. Bernadette. Okay, so Bernadette is Lourdes. Okay. Right. Um, now, when we talk about uh, the miraculous medal, uh, St. Catherine Le, Le Bure, oh. am I saying that right? The Bure? The Bure, yeah. Tell me about that, because uh, that is accompanied with a symbol. Uh, it is. Uh, that happened in uh, Rue de Bac, uh, France. Uh, that's, that's just a street in Paris. But uh, basically, Catherine's sister was a nun. Catherine wanted to join the convent as well and did. And the Virgin Mary appeared to her in that convent on Rue de Bac, 1830, and, and Rue de Bac Street in, in Paris. And... Uh, 
the Virgin Mary instructor to have this medal designed of that of its the miraculous medal of its uh, design is probably people are familiar with, and over a billion have been struck from that design, and there have been many different cures and miracles alleged to have occurred relative to the use of this metal. Now, that's, right. that's really all I know. Right. But, but uh, there was a lot of smoke and fire with Catherine Labour's uh, experience. Besides the metal, she also had a apparition of Jesus her, and herself, and uh, she also had some prophetic things told to her that uh, the local bishop would be stripped of his duds by the crowd, and that actually happened about a week later, and of course that gave great credibility to Catherine Labour's statements. Huh. And uh, that had never happened quite as dramatically as that before. And uh, like I say, these are just all, that's what I meant earlier, is these all form a mosaic of authenticity if you add them all together. It's just it's pretty striking. Um, as far as the medal goes, I mean, on the front of it, you have uh, Mary. Um, yeah. and, um, and on the opposite side, you have uh, an M right. with a cross, with a cross section bar. Going, I mean, we've got the the standard, you know, crucifix cross, but then below that, as a base up to that cross, is a straight line um, with an M, and the M is intertwined within the base of that cross um, thing. Underneath of that, we've got um, a heart with a crown of thorns and the fire coming out the top, and the other one is a heart fire coming out the top with a sword going through it. Right. Um, then we have 12 stars, which I'm going to take a wild leap here and say that's the 12 uh, apostles. Probably. Okay. So is there any literal translation by anyone? Did Mary say what this symbology meant um, or what it was supposed to represent? Other than saying, no, she didn't like go into chapter and verse that I know of on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just said, indicate to have this medal struck after this model. All who wear it will receive great graces. They should wear it around the neck. Graces will abound for those who wear it with confidence, end quote. That's that's all I know. I mean, uh, as a researcher, that's all. I, now there may have been more that I didn't come to find out, but that's about all I knew. Um, was that just drawn by um, Saint Catherine? I mean, was that yes. it was drawn down, and then she had it, you know, yeah, obviously yeah. clean, cleaned up and 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 struck. Yeah, her confessor um, took it, and they they had it made, struck at that. Point. And those are not supposed to be made out of any precious metal. Now that I don't know either. I hadn't dealt. I, I, I the metal I, I included it, but as part of the apparition. But I didn't really stress too much the you know elements of the who, right. what, why I read the metal. I mean, you had mentioned um, earlier on pivotal moments of uh, Marian apparitions. Yeah. What kind of pivotal moments are we talking about? Are we talking about incredibly liminal states in the world uh, during well, times of seeing her? Well, like like in the 1531 deal uh, with Juan Diego, that was at a time where the Spanish were treating the Indians like subhumans, enslaving them, this, that, and the other for the most part. And when she appeared to Juan Diego, that elevated the status of the Indians and the Spanish ideas, too. If the Virgin Mary is going to appear to this Indian, they must be all right kind of principle. <laughs> and, it did, and it did moderate the Spanish's treatment very much of the Indians. And it, it also was the... Before, the, basically the beginning of the New World, and uh, I guess 600 people, 600 million people eventually became Christians and Catholics and so forth as a result of that episode. And other things, like the, the Fatima pivotal experiences right before World War II, and she came mm-hmm. up with a prophecy very typical at that time. But also, there's other ones that are not as well known, like at uh, pont Main, uh France in the 1870s, uh, you know, the Germans were invading France again, like they always do, and uh, the local populace had a background of revering the Virgin Mary and, uh, um, you know, uh, calling on her for intercession, as Catholics do. Mm-hmm. And uh, what had happened is they were afraid of the Germans, uh, understandably, mm-hmm. and uh, they prayed that their town would be they prayed that their town would be spared, and uh, basically Mary did appear to a family in uh, that town and some other related witnesses, and uh, the Germans actually got a – the word got back to the Germans that the Virgin Mary was appearing to these townspeople in France. They, they turned around and didn't invade, which was mm. kind of striking. But mm. that's not the only time that's happened. There is a uh, – 
a legend, if you will, or modern legend that in 1920, the uh, Russians were tr- going to invade Poland. And they're right at the, you know, Warsaw. All they had to do was f- cross over the Vistula River to invade, take over the country like always. And uh, they saw an image of the Virgin Mary in the sky in right near Warsaw. And the Russians turned tail, went all the way back to Moscow. And I swear mm. it happened just that way. Mm. And this is a well, well authenticated story. I mean, uh, I wasn't there. I don't have pictures like in some other things. Sure. But, yeah. But it, it, I mean, this is in relatively modern times, 1920, and it was pretty illogical for the Russians to go to all the trouble to go to Warsaw and you know take it over and take over the country and all that, and then just turn around, and that's exactly what happened. Mm. Curious. I mean, go ahead. I mean, we've had a uh, gentleman by the name of Dr. David Clark on the show who talked about the Angel of Mons and why, yeah. uh, well, basically how that whole story got started and how it was fictional. And essentially yeah. people heard that story and then took it literally and then it became kind of a life of its own. Right. Um, uh, you know, th- that kind of thing. I mean, it, it's tough when you start talking about wartime and that kind of thing because you've yeah. got all sorts of propaganda that surrounds war and all sorts of you know the the, the you know the, the powers oh, that be everywhere are on our side type of thing. Oh, uh, I understand. that's a well, but I'm but but curious that the, curious that the Russians would turn around and go back. Uh, well, I mean, but who knows I'm why? Not, I mean, you know, I mean, the general in charge is going to have to explain to the superiors why would you just turn around, buddy? I mean, what kind of deal is this? I mean. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in other words, something like that would not be taken lightly. And actually, that's, like I said, it happened at Pont Maine, it happened in Warsaw, mm-hmm. and it happened in the Philippines in the 1980s. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, apparitions, which basically forestalled a lot of, you know, murder and mayhem. And uh, I guess that's what I was saying. There's a whole richness to this stuff. If you if you look at all the little things, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it really yeah. is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of another show now that was on, uh, our dear friend Oprah's, uh, network, uh, called Miracle Detectives. And, um, oh, yeah. and on that show, they went to the Holy Love campus, uh, because a woman there, Maureen Sweeney Tile, no doubt you've heard of her. Um, you know, they showed some photographs on there that, um, I ain't buying it for a New York minute. Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not really familiar with that one. No. Um, so you're not you're not familiar with uh, Maureen Sweeney Tile uh, Kyle at all? No, I'm really not. Um, I mean, she's a woman who says that you know the Virgin Mary speaks to her and and stuff like that. And um, well, no, she, I'm not familiar with her because I guess I only dealt with the one. I mean, I'm familiar with a lot of different ones, mm-hmm. but basically the more modern ones and the ones there's not really strong evidence and, and a decision made. I didn't I didn't concentrate as much on. Oh, okay. Okay, so there there was a kind, of, so there absolutely is a little bit of a um, uh, contingency of what gets in the book and what doesn't. And well, yes, because I wanted to just deal in what I thought was pretty rock solid. Mm-hmm. There's evidence of you know, witnesses of the pictures, and and I say because here once again, out of the say two three hundred that have occurred since 1900, there's only been a determination on probably eight or nine, maybe ten. Okay, so. Uh, it's really, you know, I mean, the other ones are like in the back of the book, you'd see uh, no decision, no decision, no decision once, you know, over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So that that's why in each and every little modern one I haven't studied because, well, it, it's still up in the air. Yeah. I mean, I was Even telling. Your, you know. Right, right. I mean, I was telling Jeremy on the phone today that um, you know, my aunt was a hardcore Catholic and. Yeah. Um, and uh, she was with the Salvation Army for decades, her and her husband, before he passed away. And um, um, I was reading – I don't know. I was probably – I, I want to say it was the first year of high school where I learned about um, Fatima. Uh, and I learned about it from the National Enquirer where they were selling Lourdes water. And I said, what is Lourdes water? And to my mom, and she said, oh, there's Lourdes and there's Fatima. And so I got a book about Fatima, and I was reading that. My Aunt Kathleen came up to visit – and when she saw this book on the table, she said, who's reading this? And I said, me. And I'm telling you, I got the what for. Uh, uh, because she said to me, um, do you believe that? And I said, it's pretty compelling stuff. So a lot of people saw this. She goes, well, I'm not doubting the event. Right. She said, but um, 
you, you do realize that uh, our God is a God of nature, and God does not work within apparitions and this sort of thing. How does he know? <laughs> you know, I mean... Relevant, but how the hell do they know? You know? Well, I don't know. I mean, this is what she was brought up with, and obviously oh, it had know. been taught somewhere uh, yeah. for it to be ingrained in her psyche to be that opposed to that I, notion. Yeah, I know, but what I'm trying to say is that God, in the, you know, always used angels in the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, Lot had the angels appear to him. Sure, but, yeah. Uh, this and that. I mean, it's it's been a common experience. So. Hey, you're preaching the choir. I didn't I didn't buy it either. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying that. But I'm curious I, where I, people get that from. I well, I don't know. See, that's I guess that's what I, I brought back about the George Nori UFO thing. Mm-hmm. Is that? And I'm not knocking George. I want to be back on the show and all that. If he's right. listening. But what I'm saying is <laughs> he's not. Trust me. <laughs> well, he might sometime. Who knows? <laughs> but but what I'm saying is uh, okay. What I was saying about some of the aspects about the UFO issue with this Mm -hmm. is that, let's look at this. If this has been going on for 2,000 years, and let's say the aliens are in back of it, what's their motive? To promote Catholicism? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to go holograph, project this uh, picture of the Virgin Mary, even have a couple prophecies come out, and we'll somehow, by some quirk trick of fate, have those come true. I mean, what would be their M.O. for this? I mean, even the aliens would have to go into an awful lot of trouble for an awful long time to do what? Well, can I, can I, let me just interject here for you because I'm not entirely sure how familiar you are with, with what we talk about on the show as far as the UFO stuff goes. No. Um, our kind of viewpoint on this is that, uh, I mean, of course, you, you know as well as anyone else does that the purveying overthought of the UFO is that it's an extraterrestrial culture of some sort coming here in craft and that sort of thing, or it's interdimensional. Um, we look at this in more of a uh, – this is a uh, some kind of force of some sort. What it is, we have no idea. Uh, Jeremy and I are both experiencers hardcore of this kind of thing. That's why we do this show to begin with. Yeah. Um, and so – uh, when we're looking at, um, just say, the, the UFO problem as a whole, we're not buying a whole lot of what ufology has to offer about what the UFO is. I know. Uh, People try to describe what they don't understand, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and essentially, when we had Jacques Vallée on the show and we were talking about all these ancient sightings of very strange things, right. um, some of them were – um, as you mentioned earlier in the show, uh, a man sees Mary. She says, build a church here. He builds the church there, and, and then you know, life goes on. Um, what I kind of personally took away from that, even though Jacques disagreed with me, was that there seems to be some kind of force that is not just Marian apparitions, not just UFOs, not just ghosts, or any of this other paranormal stuff in the big ball that we put that in. Yeah. Um, it is something that either feels like it's leading you around by the nose or is somehow gently nudging you or guiding you or suggesting things. Right. Um, and this is even present in psychedelic experiences, oddly enough. Um, this is the same type, type of thing where they've, they've almost made the connections that early man uh, at some point was influenced by some – thing else, which some people will call ancient aliens, some people will call psychedelics, some people will call whatever. Um, so, I, I mean, I see where you're going, kind of like, what, what would be the motive? Well, here's my question for this. What would be, uh, what in, is in my head, essentially, when it comes to uh, religion and, um, uh, and the story of Jesus and Mary and all of that, we're at some point if you're a, a godly person, you believe that there's going to be a showdown between the forces of evil and good. Um, and and my question has always been, since I was a little kid, is uh, not so much in this verbiage, but why the dog and pony show? I know. Uh, I mean, I, there's things you know, I can't answer, I'll be honest with you. Sure, of course. I don't, I don't expect you to. It's like that's one of the things that I look at and I say in the sense of, okay, uh, Mary um, gave birth to Jesus. Jesus was the son of God, or so a lot of people believe uh, in their own religions and own rights. But um, what is her motive for appearing to peasant children in France or, you know, uh, this kind of giving a medal that will um, uh, kind of receive great graces to people in that way by wearing this thing? Um, I mean, do you feel like ultimately, if you had to take a wild stab at it, would it be that this is something that is reinforcing faith 
or that's more than that? I, I think, in my best opinion, and here mm-hmm. again, I'm just a fellow. You know, I might that's okay. You're anyone. perfectly welcome to that. <laughs> but uh, in my best opinion, it is nothing but a under, undergirding of faith. That's all. Hmm. And uh, I think that mankind needs it because, you know, we forget everything we ever do. I mean, we forget our diets. We forget to, to not, you know, you know, keep bad habits. We, you know, sometimes we just, we're just a very forgetful and, and mind blown bunch. And I think we need to be reminded of faith. And I think that's the position God would take if the basic overall dyna- dynamics are true and God loves us. And, you know, he's had this ongoing experience with us. Then, you know, you throw in a messenger every now and then to do, you know, spice things up. And the Bible does underscore her actual place in the sun too. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, like in the book of John, Jesus is on the cross. He's telling uh, his disciple, you know, here is your mother. I mean, it wasn't like it's old Aunt Phyllis down the road. It was like somebody of, you know, more than has a place in the sun of things, not just, uh, you know, here's my mother or whatever. So, and other things in the Bible, there's been other apologetics for, Aunt, for Mary's position in the scheme of things. Mm-hmm. It says in Luke that, you know, generations will call me blessed. Well, I mean, that seems to have been the case. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, I don't know. If I was God, I'd do things differently. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Wouldn't I mean, we all? I would certainly, I, you know, I'm just a no-nonsense ex-army guy. I'd fix stuff. I'd fix it today. Mm-hmm. But uh, why he does things the way he does, I don't know. Yeah. Do you but think? Um, one, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you think there's anything to? This is another thing we've talked a lot about on this show: is uh, focus of intent yeah. and manifestation. Mm-hmm. And um, do you ever? Does it ever cross your mind that um, what? I mean. God, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get so much shit for this in the after chat, I know, or the or the uh, the aftermath of the show, rather. That, um, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. I mean, when people are in times of desperation and people are, are in times of, well, they're in those liminal states where they're between a rock and a hard place. They have a psychotic uh, vision. You're saying basically. Uh, no, but um, uh, is it possible that uh, in the sense of prayer? And focusing on uh, salvation and uh, deliverance and all these things that, that, of course, Mary and Jesus, they, for a lot of people, this embodies those kind of qualities. Yeah. And I wonder if this doesn't um, – if, if reality doesn't respond in some way to essentially give you what you ask for in, 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 in not so many oh, ways. It's some kind of manifestation of their desires. Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, well, you know, and that doesn't negate any kind of any kind of external entity here. I mean, all right, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you know, in some cases that could be so, but in in all these varied cases, just in a small little microcosm where it wasn't actually an apparition of Mary, but some little uh, borderline event that happens to Catholicism, like the, that uh, odor of sanctity format, mm-hmm. I was no more thinking about anything of any note or expecting a miracle. I mean, I was mostly just uh, snooping. And, uh, right. and I mean, I was not in any state that was anything but happy, you know. Mm. Or, I mean, I wasn't anticipating uh, uh, good times, bad times, anything. I was just you weren't looking for an more. event, yeah. But, but what I'm saying is that, uh, and all the people that experienced all that stuff in, in Zaitun, Egypt, with the millions of witnesses of that format, they weren't all in some, you know, religious fervor that more or less mm-hmm. psychologically induced a hallucination. No. And um, most of these witnesses, the Juan Diego types and some others, are basically just walking or going about their little pedestrian business and not really thinking about anything except here, oh, what's this? You know? mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, curious mean, that in, in some of those cases, like I'm sure there were skeptical people in Egypt. I'm sure that there were oh, – yeah. you imagine there were skeptical people at, uh, at Fatima. Um, yeah. You know, that um, – I mean, that's all very curious. I mean, it's it's a large, large amount of people. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Well, and, it was and, almost 80 to 100,000 is what they've estimated the crowd was, in fact. It's crazy. And it's crazy. many, of course, millions in the Egypt thing. But uh, I, there's not been any repressed uh, debunking of this, not at all. Right. Uh, there's been no evidence of debunking in either Fatima or Zaitun, and I have looked. There ain't any. Yeah, well, the only thing I've ever heard about Fatima is by skeptical 
you know, bunch is that um, it was a mass delusion or mass, you know, mass temporary, uh, you know, hypno- hypnotic trance type of thing. Yeah. I'm not buying it. Um, no, I don't what. know what happened at Fatima, but um, it sure as hell wasn't anything normal as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it. Uh, I know, fa- I know damn little about it. I'll be honest with you, but what I've read about it, it's like pff, this. I mean, you could look at the most basic facts here about this thing and and not see uh, what 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 people are talking about. In fact, um, that, there's the next big question. Uh, there's one picture. Am I correct uh, of Fatima? Uh, one. Well, photograph? I have a picture of the crowd. Uh, but is there not one picture of the event? I did not find one of the event. I found one of the crowd that was staring in, and like uh, aghast at what was in the sky. Hmm. But I did not find one of the photo of the event. No, I did not find it. It may exist, and I didn't find it. I mean, I haven't found everything, but I did See, not I'd find seen it. one on the net a while back that, that purported to be the only photograph of there. And it, it was, you're right, looking over top the crowd and... Um, and the sky was just, I mean, this photograph, it's not like you could make out extreme detail. But this is one I've got in the book. But the sky was a book, disaster. I mean, whatever yeah. was going on was wild. Yeah, they were kind of shocked. I mean, I'm looking at the one I have in the book, and the crowd is looking up in the sky, uh, you know, in earnest uh, shock or whatever you want to call it. But uh, it doesn't show anything hopping and bopping around in the sky. It's just basically the crowd. Right, right. I've got that picture in the book, yeah. Are you familiar with uh, Emmitsburg Grotto? I've read about it. Uh, the jury's out on that, as far as I know. Uh, Do you know the story about what happened there? Just in sketchy terms, and I, I've basically forgotten what I did know. Okay. <laughs> I, I, hate to, I hate to let you down in that. No, battle. no, that's okay. I mean, that, that is a, a replica of Lourdes. Am I correct? Uh... I mean, that was all it was really. They supposed- actually had a negative decision on Emmitsburg in Emmitsburg in '94. Oh, okay. And okay. Uh, I mean, actually, they found some negative things that would detract from the validity of that. And as I indicated earlier, when I when I found one that really was a negative, I just went on to issues that had some validity here. Right, like right. I, I mean, the reason I ask about that is my grandfather is the one who set the statue of Mary. He was a crane operator, and. Uh, uh, Oh, no. He he sat the uh, the massive statue that sticks out out of the uh, treetops there, and I always wondered like we we go to Emmitsburg every year because my granddad set the statue. Ever since he passed away, we go there every year to see the statue, and uh, um, just because of the family connection to it. And um, you know, I always walked around there going, "Did something happen here?" Because there's an awful lot of people here, and and there seems to be this purveying thought of apparitions and that sort of thing. And um, and I hear people chatting about it, and I always wondered, was there anything there or or not? I know what you're saying. Uh, well, now I've you know I've caught a blast of flack sometimes from people who've asked me uh, about what apparitions are perhaps questionable, and I've said that for, to my knowledge, there's a big question mark on the one in Conyers, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And I've gotten callers in to like coast to coast that were just chomping all over me for that. Yeah. And other shows. But because I mean, oh, there's a little, well, maybe it is. But see, there is a possibility um, in the church and in other things that people, the humans deal with, to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's certainly been many, many legal decisions which have been erroneous. And it's possible their assessment of some of the facts in these cases has not been valid. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that for five seconds. Mm. So uh, all I can say is the preponderance of evidence looks like Conyers was not good and Emmitsburg was too, according to the church. Mm. But uh, I can't say with any absolute certainty that Conyers didn't have validity. Now, uh, something I, I mentioned in the book in the early part of it and the introduction that one of the troubles is that we have to really believe all our whole society is based on what other people say. Mm-hmm. And I know people lie <laughs> and sure. they make mistakes and, and they, they miss and they misidentify stuff. But by and large, you still are bound to look at the, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. Uh, if someone tells me, like I know people that, have, that I've seen a ghost. Okay. And people could, you know, Say, ah, oh, you're a croc. You, you didn't see a ghost. Well, how do you know? The, pa- <laughs> the point is, mm-hmm. I believe if someone earnestly, if so many people earnestly have said they've seen ghosts for such an incredible amount of time in every face of the earth from every civilization, that there's some validity to the phenomenon. Uh, 
Individual examples, don't know. But uh, obviously, just like in the UFO instance where there's smoke, there's fire. But we do have to believe what people say. Mm-hmm. I've never been to Mount Everest, but I have to believe that it's there because I've always heard it is. Right. And uh, that people should not always dismiss what people say. I guess that applies in apparitions and other things, too. That's just a small point. I don't mean to belabor it. But. No, no, that's okay. Um, well, I got one more for you, and then I'm going to let Jeremy uh, take it over and wrap up. Okay. Um, I don't look at this phenomena or the UFO phenomena or any of these things as being – too tightly confined by time, at least not as far – I mean maybe as far as our perception of it, but maybe not as far as the phenomena itself. I'm taking it that, of course, all of these um, apparitions would have come after um, the time of uh, – the biblical times. I mean we, we don't have uh, visions of Jesus Christ walking uh, before he walked the earth. Is there any weird things that you see in very, very ancient – times that appear to you to look like like you know how we do in the ufo field people look at cave drawings and go that's a flying saucer um is there anything like that as it applies to something in a myriad uh, uh, you know uh, apparition or knowledge not to the best of my there's nothing that's before that time period to the best of my knowledge now i don't know everything in every case but to the best of my knowledge this phenomenon started occurring in 40 a.d and has occurred pretty frequently thereafter since thereafter and and I got I know, I know the cave dwellings you're talking about where the, I saw that at the Roswell UFO festival about a year ago where they had right security. and I'm going to steal one more before you go um you know ufology is pretty well known for its distrust of the government the government knows this and knows that I personally don't feel it knows anything but that's me I know. I know. Um, <laughs> is does the Catholic Church or any church take the place of the government in Marian op, you know apparitions? Um, do you think they know more than they're telling? Do you no. think they cover things up? Do you think that they're they, holding? Yes, they have. They have. But I think uh, yes, they have. Uh, and I, I get in trouble for that. But I get in trouble for so many things. I can't keep track. Of <laughs> but there's been some. Uh, there seems to be, let's put it this way, there seems to be a, a strong undercurrent of thought that there's more to the third secret of Fatima, for example, than is, has been That's, uh, yeah. made known. That's what and I was alluding group, to, yeah. <laughs> there's even a group called Fatimists that met in May of 2010 in Rome. Uh, they had a man named Christopher Ferrara that is a U.S. attorney and very, very familiar with investigations. And, and to paraphrase him, he said, there's no way... <laughs> <laughs> that what they told us is what this was. There's just no way. I mean, there's more right. left on the table that's not being discussed. Right. And and uh, that's all I can really say at this point on that. But I mean, that it's the right mogul balloon of the Fatima. <laughs> you know, it's it's the mogul balloon exclusive. That comes that's right from the Catholic News Service too. So right. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, okay. Well, yes, there's some things like that. On a similar note, I guess I have uh, a final question, which is, uh, have governments tried to cover it up, and or have they scrambled jets after these apparitions? To the best of my knowledge, there's been nothing like that in the scrambled jets kind of format. Uh, no, most governments don't really seem to – they basically keep their mitts off of it, even like the uh, Egyptian example, even though they were basically – oh, by the way, Muslims actually do venerate the Virgin Mary. Uh, they do. She does have a place in the sun with them, I mean, if you will as opposed to just another woman. Uh, she's revered, if you will. But uh, but basically, no, they're not going to endorse Christianity, even though they might think Mary's a fine you know, example of, of motherhood and so forth. But what I'm saying is that uh, they, ha- they have not really tried to suppress this, to my knowledge, except in little examples, little petty examples, like in Portugal, the socialists tried to put it down because they weren't, didn't really want the church to be endorsed or something like that. There's been little petty examples, but nothing like in the UFO field where I feel there's real censorship. No. Uh, okay, and, and really, this will be my last one, <laughs> but I just thought of it. Uh, do these have um, a duration? I mean, how long do they last generally? Well, generally, now, Catherine Labour had uh, apparitions of the Virgin Mary for many years, but I don't think any of them have lasted any, as long as the 30 years the Medjugorje experience has been going on. Usually, they're actually fairly short duration. Like you know, uh, six months or a year now. Now uh, in Borang and Banal, Belgium, uh, some of the no, Banal, Belgium, uh, the, the apparitions actually she kept appearing to this particular seer for many, many years too, but uh, off and on. But uh, most of them are short duration, within a period of 
from one day to two weeks or a month or something like that. And when they stop appearing, do they announce? Does does Mary announce she's not going to appear after such and yes. such a date? Yes. Hmm, interesting. Well, Kevin Cook, thank you very much uh, for talking yes. Marian Apparitions with us. The book is wow. Marian Apparitions Are Real, and the website is com. So that's simple enough to remember. Yeah, if they need the book in the ebook form or anything like that, they can get it at Barnes and Noble or just order directly or walk into a Barnes and Noble and get one. All right, great. And I do have that radio show, LiveParanormal.com, on uh, Fridays at 11 Eastern. LiveParanormal.com, and is, that's the the station. What is, is is your show called, Live Paranormal? No, it's Paranormal Mysteries. Paranormal Mysteries on LiveParanormal.com. Yes, yes. Very sir. good. All right, well, thank you, sir. You're more than welcome. I appreciate you. All right. Have a good night. You too. You've been listening to Paratopia with Jeffrey Ritzman and Jeremy Vane, and I could care less. So the Jeff. So the Jer. Here we are yet again at the end of another episode of Paratopia. And what have we learned? What have we learned, Jeff? That 100,000 plus people gathered together in one place are not fervored. (laughs) Sorry. I'm sorry, Kevin. I'm not. I I meant to bring that up um, when we were speaking. But, uh, you know, when when he mentioned that, uh, and I think this is a, it's an interesting wrinkle that just, I don't know, kind of presents itself when you look at the whole of the paranormal. And we've talked a lot on this show about focus of intent and liminal states and marginality and all that. And then manifestations happen. This is not to say the manifestations aren't real. That does not what that means. Um, but it's what is it made of? What is its mechanic? Um, that sort of thing. And on one hand, you could look and say, this is the, um, uh, th- this is coming to us, uh, via the pipeline from God. Or you can say, uh, is this possibility, that um, that many people gather together in one place. That's more people than Woodstock. That's what th- what's over three times more. Think about that. Go watch Woodstock tonight, people. Look at that crowd. You're talking a crowd about a crowd three times larger, more than gathered together in one place for for this for for this thing. So I don't think we can really say that crowd wasn't worked up and fervored uh, to see something miraculous. And when something miraculous happened. Well, there you are. I mean, it's. Um, uh, I could easily make the argument that that was uh, generated by one of the largest groupings of people ever assembled on the planet, and that's <laughs> that's 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 a I think a valid point to mention. So I, I don't buy that those people weren't fervored or at least worked up and focused on it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if you can put aside all of your theological questions or doubts or all of that, and just look at a phenomena that's occurring, I think it's an interesting phenomena. I certainly think the Egypt thing, I'm going to look more into the Egypt thing and Our Lady of Guadalupe, because I'll be damned if I've ever heard of anything uh, that looks like that. And you guys can look on our message board and see that in this show thread. Um, I'll be damned if that's not pigment. I mean, I I can't buy that until I lay eyes on it. Um, that looks every bit like a painting. I mean, if it's been examined by a lab, I'm going to look at that and I'm going to try and find out someone, you know, I can contact at that lab who maybe looked at it and, and maybe we can get some kind of opinion on that. But, uh, if that's truly the, the, I'll put it this way. There can't be no pigment. There can't be. It's impossible for an image to exist without pigment. In, in, on a medium surface. Uh, so what is the pigment? I know what the medium is. What's the pigment? Is the pigment gathered within the cell structure of the cactus skin or husk? Um, that would be interesting. I'd want to know how that happened. The only thing that I can think of, um, and you know, I, and again, I'm not buying the People so long ago wouldn't know how to do this or bullshit. People can figure out a lot of things. Yeah, the the whole time I was thinking Da Vinci. Yeah, I mean, um, 
is it possible that there is uh, maybe natural juices or chemicals that can invoke a pigmented response in the inside of that husk? And has some kind of culture maybe stumbled onto that or found something that works like that? And is that what we're seeing? But I look at that and I go, <laughs> if that were photographically perfect, if it were so incredibly rich in dimension – and form, I would go, that is pretty amazing. But that looks every bit of its era of art. It looks every bit of a painting to me, uh, and it looks every bit of human perception and the application of art onto a medium. It looks like art to me. It's beautiful, but it looks like art. Well, here's the a question. I just know a little bit about uh, how the art world works from uh, dealing with uh, Melissa Reed's mm-hmm. uh, trying to get a, a painting uh, sort of dated and, and trying to figure out who the artist is. Um, and that's that to preserve these paintings, they wash them. They do all sorts of things to them. They, they fill in the pigments, um, you know, that, that might be missing in, in something. Right. Could all of that sort of process of taking apart a painting and, and putting it back together, uh, you know, if you're dealing with cactus skin, could that actually um, take away the pigment from whatever instrument one is using to examine it uh, in, a, in a lab? I'm not sure I follow how you're. What I mean, it's not, as though, it's not as though he's saying that that uh, a lab looked at this and said there's no pigment, right? There's no pigment on the medium. That's right. So. Could that not be because um, whatever they were doing to preserve this thing all of these years sort of manipulated in such a way that pigment wouldn't show up in the in the way that a lab would be searching for it? Uh-huh. Um, because I guess, you know, as far as paintings go, the actual painting that you're looking at in a museum ain't the painting. Mm-hmm. I mean, that painting's gone. What you're looking at is something that has been not just retouched, but, I mean, we're talking like washed <laughs> we're talking restructured on the canvas uh all sorts of stuff mm. so when we we're talking about a cactus shell or husk uh what goes into keeping the maintenance up on that well i mean as far as it goes with with paintings i mean if you're talking about like van gogh or renoir and all those i mean those have been uh restored but um you know I, i've been i've watched them do um restoration of paintings and whatnot when I was back in college. And, uh, I mean, the washing of them, it's, I mean, it's an extraordinarily delicate process that they, that they use to do that. Number one, cause they don't want to damage, uh, the structure or the bond of the oil paint onto the canvas. Um, I mean, that's their biggest worry is they're going to remove something. Um, but when they, when they actually retouch something, uh, they are working on the most minute of areas in order to like if you've got crazing or something like that in an oil painting, which is really common with age, and even if you're looking at like pot boiler paintings um, of today, those will craze within ten to fifteen years, and that's a modern oil paint. So uh, I'm not necessarily seeing that you're not seeing the actual painting, but you're seeing spots on that painting that are genuinely not from the artist's hand who painted it. There's a lot of restoration that's going on with a lot of paintings out there. So what sort Uh, of restoration would go into a cactus? uh, Well, here's what I'm thinking. I mean, if you're going to, if a lab has examined and said there's no pigment there, that means that uh, on some level, I would expect to have had a small sample taken of a pigmented area of of an area of that painting that, or an area of that husk that shows color. Uh, somehow, and that would then have to be chemically uh, examined and separated to say what is the pigment that is making that up, and then that person would have to tell me there is no pigment there. The color that you are seeing is the husk, which I, I think is what is being said here. If that's the case, uh, okay, I'll take that as a little weird. If they're just examining it through a microscope, and saying there's no pigment there, I'm not sure that I would buy that. As an artist myself, I have seen uh, mediums that you can paint on that, for lack of a better word, the minute that the brush hits it, it's soaking it up, 
and then you can wipe that thing. You can wipe the surface pigment off, and the actual item, the actual medium, is stained. Uh, I have to wonder if this is in a staining process rather than. Um, That's what I'm getting a, at. Yeah, a surface paint. It's um, sort of tattooed. Exactly, exactly. But if they did a, um, if they did a chemical makeup of what that is, and they didn't come away with anything but husk, um, I would want a deeper analysis of. Um, the nature of that husk and what does it have as opposed to a control sample where there is no pigment at all. What are the differences? That's where you would find any trace of pigment that would be there to make it the color that it is. And when did they do these tests? That's another thing we've got to find out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ultra jazzed because I am going to look into that because if, if there's nothing there, there's, I, I can't. I can't think of any way that it would be there without pigment. There is pigment or you wouldn't see it. The question is, what is the pigment? To say there's no pigment is wrong. I mean, there's pigment if you can see an image. Um, otherwise, you just see the husk. <laughs> so there, it's either a husk of the pigment, you know, the, the pigment of the husk, or it's not. So what, which is it? Um, well, the idea that's is what that's I'd a miracle, know. right? That's the idea. But, uh, you know, I got to say, when I was mentioning that show with the, the good looking host that was on here some years back, that show did a great job. I mean, she was very respectful of uh, people's belief systems. But uh, I think there was and I'll never remember the name of this, but somebody out there probably in the listener land will remember it. There's a church that has the blood of a saint and it's in kind of like a. Um, I don't know. It's in something that kind of reminds me of the holy hand grenade from uh, <laughs> from uh, uh, the Monty Python movie. It's in a globe, and it's dried, and it's on like a standard that they, they walk around through the crowd or they parade it through this particular route. Uh, and if this blood liquefies, that means that um, – you know, there, there's going to be prosperity and, and, and good things for this town or this community. And um, I remember her saying that one year it did not liquefy and something bad happened. And then it, it, it does almost every year. And she was there when they were parading it around. And sure enough, it liquefied. However, she went to scientists and said, look at this. How would you explain this? And then they showed you how – Two chemicals can not mix together. Uh, you wouldn't see – just kind of like oil and water. You would see this uh, – the oil settles to the bottom of water. And if this were in a globe completely sealed, you wouldn't see the water. You'd only see the oil. And if the oil would then become solid, uh, whatever matter was in this thing, the scientist said it could be this. If you sit it still, it will harden. When you move it and you change the temperature, it liquefies. Did they explain it? They explained how it could have been done, um, but they don't say this conclusively proves it, but there is a way it can be done. Um, she was very good about kind of exposing certain things as it's curious, but it's not impossible. It's not a miracle. Um, even with uh, St. Bernadette, I mean, that picture on our message board right now um, – you can see she is a, a pretty woman, and uh, and she's been dead for a very long time. Um, again, why? I don't know. Um, that's why I was asking about: Is there a conspiracy theory in with the Vatican? Like, are they propping her up somehow? Is that really her in there? You can't go up and touch her. She's in a glass coffin. Is it really her? Is it a wax figure? Is this being done to bolster faith in? I, I mean, I don't know. It's like they say, trust no one. What did I say this week? Trust no one. I've got to put my hands on it. I've got to see it. I, I want to talk to somebody, Ugh. you know, I, I know, but, <laughs> uh, you know, is that really her? Because if that's really her, she looks amazing. What is the process? Somebody get a core sample of St. Bernadette. I want to know what is doing that. Um, is it a miracle? I don't know if it's a miracle, but it's certainly wild. Um, and you think about the Egyptian mummies and they say, those people, look how well they're preserved. Blew. They look like human beef jerky. Um, yeah, are they very old? Yes. Um, 
But uh, they say it's amazing that the mummy has lips and eyelids and a little bit of hair. That's amazing. And it is amazing. But look at St. Bernadette. She looks like she was just laid out yesterday. That's crazy. By the way, to your question about whether there have been Marian visions prior to this, um, yeah. I mean, if you look to other cultures, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. She just wasn't called Mary. Uh, She was called other things. Um, And Hmm. in fact, if you look to... Once again, Kundalini um, is considered the you know the feminine serpent or whatever you know all of that uh, mm. who speaks to you. I mean, there is something about the sacred feminine uh, that has been with us throughout time that these Marian visions would appear to be a part Maybe of like if you part of. allow right. yourself outside of your particular box to see that. Right. Uh, then you know it's there for you to see. Hmm. Curious. Uh, I don't know. I mean, curious, sir. It's it's interesting. I mean, I I thought it was interesting. I um, I like to read the book. I like to see how deep it gets. Um, uh, I I mean, it's a podcast, and you've only got a limited amount of time. But um, uh, you know, Kevin seemed kind of like I don't know. He kind of just glazed over certain things, which we were covering a lot. So I'll, that's fine. But I want to know more. I want to know deeper. I want to know what the analysis was on this and that, and 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 who did the analysis and. I, I mean, the Huss thing is really bothering me. Um, so I've, I've got to find out more about that. But it's an interesting phenomenon. I'll give it that. Yes, indeed. Well, the Jeff, we have come to the end of our rope. Time? Show? Have we already? Haven't we already? Yeah. Uh, any final words on our way out the dough? Um... Uh, well, I do have one thing that's uh, curious, and I'm just – again, I'm mentioning it for the uh, the drinking crowd. Um, and because I think this would be a good way to kind of catalog this stuff. Somebody's keeping track somewhere, I'm sure. Somebody who doesn't like me probably. Sunday night, I went to bed pretty late, 3 a.m. probably, roundabout, and um, went right to sleep. And something woke me up. Um, I didn't know what time, but it was still dark outside and, uh, something I woke up from a dead sleep to wide awake and, um, I'm laying there on my right side and on the ceiling, there seemed to be, um, a red, not direct light, but indirect light as if, um, as if there was a light beside me, uh, in the bed that was shining on the ceiling. Uh, it was very, very red, and there seemed to be – like here's a, probably a good experiment. Go into a dark room if you have a, uh, any kind of – well, your computer monitor would probably be a good way to do it. Uh, put a red screen on your computer monitor. Turn all the lights out. Aim your monitor at the ceiling if you've got plasma or, or uh, LCD, and uh, kind of wave your hand in front of it. You won't see a hand. You'll just see a dark uh, kind of half shadow within this indirect light that's on the ceiling. That's what I was seeing. I was seeing a red reflected light with something blocking it out at certain intervals that was of not a clear enough shape to be able to discern what it was. So immediately, knowing that my wife, myself, and my son all just got new smartphones, my wife is probably (laughs) woke up in the middle of the night and is playing with something on her phone. And I'm thinking to myself, God, would she just go back to sleep and put the phone down? And about that time, the toilet flushes in the bathroom. And I think, ah, here comes my kid. He's going to duck his head in here and say, what are you doing? Lisa comes out of the bathroom. (laughs) Uh, And as soon as she comes out of the bathroom, the light on the ceiling is gone. And I said, okay. And I look over on the table where, you know, she puts her chargers and all that. The phone is off. The iPod is off. There's nothing making any light. Our alarm clock is um, is a very, very pale, low-light blue color. Wait, how did you not know your wife wasn't next to you? Well, I didn't move. Oh, yeah, I didn't you were even... looking at, you were on your back looking at the No, no, I was on, on my side? right side. Oh, I was oh, oh. on my right side facing the door. She's on, she's on the back of me. Um and I didn't even roll over. I just looked up and I saw that and I thought, well, she's just messing with her phone. And then when she came out of the bathroom and it was gone, I was like, wait a minute. So what the hell was that? Um, we have Venetian blinds in our room. They were shut tight. Uh, no lamps were on. There was 
literally no source of light at all in the room aside from the alarm clock, which is, like I said, a very pale whitish blue. So I don't know what that was. Um, but damn, I mean, this thing was actually casting a shadow on the small frame um, that's on the ceiling that encompasses our pull down stairs for the attic. I mean, I saw a shadow of this reflected light on that, you know, on that frame. It was casting a shadow. What it was, I haven't a clue. Um, but it was there, I don't know, two minutes. I mean, maybe almost two minutes. I was laying there just looking at it going, Pfft. I shut my eyes and I'd look up again and it'd still be there. And then I hear the toilet flush and out she comes. So I don't know what that was, but um, I'm just putting that down in the notepad. And uh, anybody playing a drinking game, uh, it's your shot. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I got nothing I want to talk about. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Well, let me ask you this. Um, What did the academic have to say about that, what you can't talk about, that it's complete nonsense, it's utter left field, or... Um, or that he's never heard of it. I mean, there's a definitive difference between I've never heard of anything like that to it's right. nonsense. No, he's saying it's nonsense. Um, <laughs> and that um, what he really said, which makes more sense to me than anything, is that Phil needs to give me something, right? He could give a transcript. He could. In fact, I asked him last week for the name of a professor. Right? Yeah. A reasonable request, and I still haven't heard back yet. Mm. Um, now he does... Ah! What the fuck? Hold on. <laughs> oh my god, that scared the shit out of me. What? <laughs> I thought a giant bug just tried to land on me, but it was actually um, the f- sponge from my headphones flying into my face, <laughs> landing on the heater. <laughs> gotta, leave, gotta leave that in. <laughs> Good lord. Anyway, where was I? What was I just saying? I have no idea. I'm too ensued with the hilarity of this. God, I wish I'd have been there for I that. A giant cockroach just flew into my mouth. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs>